when you take a look that there are about 180 uh, medical uh, teaching institutions, only 11 of them have an addiction medicine yeah. program. I'm Flint Anderson, founder of Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need. I've been in recovery since 2001, and there isn't much I don't know about recovery. And my mission is to constantly tell the truth about addiction, to make the realities of addiction, recovery, and drug culture known, and to drive awareness and advocate change that ultimately saves lives. And I'm Jason Lachance, a certified recovery coach with a passion for speaking with others and sharing their knowledge to help others seek recovery and maintain long-term sobriety. And this is the Don't Hide the Scars podcast, presented by Pain, parents and addicts in need. Susan Bartz Herrick, thank you for joining myself, Jason Lachance, and the founder of Pain, Flynn Anderson, on the Don't Hide the Scars podcast. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, uh, no, thank you for not only joining us, but for sharing not only your experience, but that of your son's life. Um, and one of the things that really touched my heart when you when Luke's story and yours came across our desk is, is Flint, we've, we've talked about this here on the podcast. We're seeing kind of a dip in the advocacy piece amidst you know the fentanyl crisis the opioid crisis it just seems less people are talking right now yeah I, I i susan i think there's a couple things going on uh, you know we we in the united states we have a he's moving me over again because i always get out of focus here in the uh, how, how sly was that you know um you know i i think we all did a damn good job of of making this awareness piece out there uh, over the last four years uh, about about fentanyl, the dangers of fentanyl, one pill can kill, bus stop benches, you know, uh, signs on on street corners, and uh, you know, again, going to our lawmakers, whatever whatever the case may be. But like anything else in this country, we have a tendency to go ball. Excuse my language. Sometimes we go balls <laughs> to the wall on something, oh, yeah. and then we have then we have a tendency to dip again. And I think we're 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 at that dip. Now you bring in the long-term harm reduction piece to this, or harm reduction in general. Uh, we're 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 putting recovery off to the side uh, just to keep people on maintenance uh, programs and and not giving solutions to 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 actual treatment. Um, and then one more thing is is that the lawmakers. They're not asking us, the people that have had long-term recovery, what works and what doesn't. Exactly. There exactly. It is. You know, and <clears throat> I found something too. Um, when I was doing the research for my book, I mean, I am an academic, but not in the scientific field. So mm -hmm. I, I really delved into it. And what I found is that there's a lot of really good beneficial information in the scientific community but it is written in the language uh in medicalese in scientific at a you know a great 18 plus level and having been a professor excuse me a professor in the field of communications we know that we have to target to uh, a reading audience that is about a level uh, sixth grade, seventh grade. So, I mean, there is this tremendous gap. And um, that was one of the uh, purposes I had is to try to bridge this gap, because I think if more people had better information that they could digest, it would mean something. And I was also, um, I was grateful to uh, Beth Macy and um, to the new Netflix uh, painkiller for putting this information out there. I saw a rise um, from friends of mine, you know, who just said, wow, I never knew, you know, so it's validating and um, uh there is already a screenplay that has been written about Luke's story. Mm -hmm. And that's a hope of mine is to get it out more to the public. Unfortunately, the screenplay does not go into the depth 
of the research that um, I went through in the book because, um, yes, it's a story of my son and I, but about every second or third chapter, I just really relay what is going on public policy, why these things are failing. And um, I was really uh, shocked and dismayed with the medical community hmm. about how many people uh, don't know. And furthermore, they really don't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. And you're, you're absolutely I right. I had to live through that, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, 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 we deal with a lot of, of parents that have lost children to this and they go through the exact same thing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I would sincerely hope uh, I, I am an avid movie watcher. Avid. Are you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have, I, 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 you know, I, I got to have a TV on all the time, even at night when I sleep. Um, it's really movie stupid. wallpaper, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and when I'm watching, when I'm watching some of these programs, especially as it relates to substance abuse, you know, mm -hmm. my only, my only hope for the screenplay is that they actually have, they have somebody on set that knows what the hell they're talking about. Um, you know, as far, as far as what, what's the word I'm trying to think of here, a, um, consultant, mm -hmm. right. Um, because I see some of this stuff and, you know, even in the movie dope sick, you know, as much as I, as much as I loved that, that movie. Or, or that 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 small series on Netflix. I'm sitting. There, I, I could pick that thing apart, just almost al almost line by line. You know. Um, so so you know that's that's one thing. And 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 going back when you're talking about the comprehension level here, um, I, I totally agree with that. I also agree with this. And I was telling Jason this the other day. There was a friend of mine. I was out at my golf club and I was t to, to, to a man that is extremely bright. Okay. Loves what I do, loves what we do here. I mean, this guy's a business genius. He's got, got kids, the whole, the whole deal. And again, we were just talking about fentanyl and, and whatnot. And he could not comprehend when I told him that fentanyl addicts, we, we search out fentanyl. That's the drug we have to have now because a Vicodin or a Norco, sometimes even heroin, aren't going to take care of our needs, that mm -hmm. he just, he, he about lost it. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, I thought just everybody that tried it died. And I'm going, Tom, no, that's, that's, that's not the case right. here. You know, right. so again, it, it goes back to all levels of, of individuals that don't understand because they're not being told the right information. Exactly. Exactly. No, I, um, I have the uh, creative rights on the uh, screenplay. And one of the things that we're looking for is that the uh, director, the producer, that everybody's got a little skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So everybody understands. Good. Good. Because I, I agree. I mean, uh, education, knowledge is power and we have to get it out there somehow uh, it it hurts me too i'm i'm on quite a few of the facebook groups of a lot of uh mothers parents family members who have lost children they don't understand i mean why did right. my son choose the drugs over me right why why wouldn't my daughter stop they don't understand the science behind how the, the midbrain is changed and how all of that works together. They don't understand tolerance that, right. you know, it, it's not going out chasing the high. A lot of the times it's the brain literally thinks it's going to die without yes. the drug. Yes. And you act according to accordingly to what your brain says. Correct. I mean, my son was... Uh, Whoa, we just had quite a story. Um, he had two thirds, pro probably two thirds of the precursors to mm -hmm. addiction. Now, this is something that a lot of people don't know that right. there are about 13 precursors, and, and um, that statistically, two out of 10 people who will try narcotics will say, Oh, wow. I have never felt this better in my life. I want it just feel good. The eight 
out of 10. It's like, ooh, I don't like this. I don't like how I feel. There's a neurobiochemical difference. You know, all brains are not alike. Why do certain people get cancer? Others don't. Right. You know, a substance use disorder is a uh, a chronic disease, not a moral failing. And that really Correct. is the thesis that I have running through my book and every time I talk about it. And, you know, trying to explain chronic uh, diseases, cancer, heart, uh, kidney, uh, diabetes, statistically, 10 to 15 percent of these cancers are genetic Mm -hmm. the rest of them it is environment or a lifestyle what the same stats hold pretty true to sud and yet as a disease we are not treated the same way that these other are i mean there's what 30 some drugs for diabetes um over 50 for heart and over a hundred for cancer. How many do those with SUD have to help them transition off or to be of aid if needed? You wouldn't tell a cancer patient, no, you, you, you have to pray this away. New Perceptions North, the premier drug and alcohol treatment and recovery center in Central California. A full continuum of medically supervised top quality care with programs for detox and patient residential treatment with dual diagnosis, intensive outpatient treatment, sober living support groups, and more. New Perceptions North provides adult men and women with the highest caliber of professional health care, treating each client with compassion and respect in a safe, comfortable environment to begin the process of recovery to proudly create and sustain a life without addiction. Call 559-978-1507 or visit newperceptionsnorth.com. There's a couple things you said there that are just enormously important. Um, One of them, though, is, look, I'm old school a lot in this. Um, I got clean in 2001 and, um, I just, I was kind of in the middle of the Oxycontin, uh, era. Um, although I, although I was not, you know, I was not an Oxycontin user. Uh, Mm -hmm. my, my, my drug was any other opiate. Uh, in fact, I didn't even, I didn't even know about Oxy till I got to my fourth and final treatment center. Um, but my, my, I just went off for a minute. (laughs) Um, but, but. (laughs) <laughs> but but where this stands when you're talking about the disease of addiction mm-hmm. and you are you are right on on all points um but the first thing we have to do like like anything else is we have to get the person off of the drug oh absolutely so so, so absolutely. we know what to do from there you know it, it's like it's like parents and 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 there's a couple things on this parents and God bless them. And, and for the for the parents that have lost children, this is so hard for me sometimes to even say. But they want to blame something else. They want to, they want, oh, they were ADHD, they were bipolar, they were this, they were they were that. When a lot of these drugs mimic those mental health issues that and and, and they there may not be a mental health issue there. That I've had to tell parents sometimes, you're, I'm sorry, but your son or your daughter was just a good old fashioned drug addict. They were the three out of the 10, okay, that said, whoa, I like this because we don't take drugs to make us feel bad. We take drugs to make us feel right. good. And right. by the way, they're very good. Yeah. All right. Well, I didn't experience it in my anxiety disorder until I was really pretty far into my alcoholism. Yeah, I it oh, really? didn't really spike up. And I, I know there were some things from childhood and, hey, I'm dyslexic and all these these different things. Mm-hmm. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's such a great point. It, it, I noticed it got worse because alcohol is an amazing anxiety drug, you know. And so My, the, uh, more, the more I used it, Luke's father, then when I wasn't, he, the anxiety, yeah. you know. Luke's, You're saying Luke's, Luke's father dad? was a, a functioning alcoholic and Mm -hmm. twice a week he would drink a great deal i mean case of beer uh and because it 
it is a depressant in the brain. It, it brings right. it on down. And then I would see the escalation. I was, you know, um, genetically, um, I mean, Luke, uh, he didn't sleep probably past six months. He was just right. on fire, had uh, general anxiety disorder. Right. He was just geared high. Um, he had a DD. Um, my mother just begged me not to put him on Adderall. I wish I would have listened. You know, um, mm -hmm. Adderall is an amphetamine, the speed. Uh, a, a methamphetamine, a, and meth. You know, I mean, they're they're not the same drug, but they're cousins. And when you think of children's brains, yep. they develop in those first 10, 12 years. All of the circuitry is getting put together then. And if you start throwing drugs into the mix at that age, you're almost assuring you might have some challenges down the way because the brain recognizes the drug, says, oh, this is familiar, right. and it wants more of it. I went to a, um, I, Jason knows this story, I went to a, a SART group, you know, the parent-teacher group at one of the local oh, high yeah. schools here. Mm -hmm. And this is, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. And I walked in there and I had all the teachers sitting there and some of the parents. And my first question to everybody was, I said, when did everybody get their medical degree here? <laughs> and yeah, I wasn't very popular. Google, Facebook, <laughs> and, <laughs> on Facebook. Right, I'm a graduate right, all the of reputable Google places. Academy. Yes. Right? Right. And, they're go and they're going, what? Right. And I'm going, right. seriously, I'm going, because you may not be prescribing the drug, all right, mm -hmm. but you are certainly culpable in a, you know in talking these parents into putting their five year olds on Ritalin and Adderall. I said, do you understand what you're doing here? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's it's yeah, it's it's maddening. It's just absolutely maddening. And 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 of course, when you are again, my my story, all those surgeries as a kid, one a year to the time I was 13, four more in 1976, and on and on and on up until present. Wait, you don't think my opioid receptors got changed from day one? <laughs> of course I did. Exactly. Of course I did. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Oh goodness. Uh Susan, so I mean, thank you for sharing that about Luke's childhood, but when did the opioids really come into play with him? Um, I tell you, um, Luke had some trauma. His dad and I divorced. We mm. pr uh, pretty much lost, <clears throat> excuse me, everything when he was 10. And I was quite lost in my own pain at that time. Um, when he was uh, almost 14, he had a pilonidal cyst on the back of his tailbone. They mm -hmm. went into surgery. He got prescribed um, Percocet, Oxycontin. He sprained his thumb in an accident, got prescribed more Oxycontin, uh, thumb surgery, getting his teeth out. So between the ages of 14 and 17, he was prescribed it four times. These are the years that they were passing the stuff out like Pez. Right. Okay. And I finally, um, I had to face my own denial because mm -hmm. I don't think any parent really wants to see it. And I remember pushing, well, maybe it's just him being a kid, but I had to really take a look at what was going on. And I was fortunate, uh, and he was also misdiagnosed as being a uh, bipolar at the time. I liked that diagnosis because it gave me a reason, just like you said. Okay. So Depakote, Seroquel. Um, oh God. Yep. Yeah. And, and it turned him into a maniac and he begged me mom i don't want to take this i went and found a psychologist who just sat me down and he said susan i need you to hear me your son is very depressed he is very sad and he is also medicating through substances alcohol and narcotics you've got to do something he uh suggested that i go 
find a doctor that could prescribe Suboxone to help ease him off. And there were three in the state, only three. Nobody else bothered to get the X waiver. And right. it was very successful. Now, I didn't know at this time about treatment centers. I didn't know what the other options were. I just knew I found this. I didn't want him on any drugs at all, but something that could help taper him off would be great. And he was doing well. Um, he was 18, and a few months after that, he was in a near-fatal car accident. Oh, and when I say near fatal. Um, they gave him 1% chance. He was thrown out the side window. His his back was broken this way. Oh, um, not Yeah. Um, burst T fracture, uh, pretty much crushed in, in, internally. And uh, he was on life support for a week. Of course, you know, I'm just praying with the machine with every breath. And at about the fourth day, they they came in. They said, "It looks like he's he'll make it." Um, and then I looked over and I saw the morphine that yep. Dilaudid. I saw all those bags of drugs, and I said, "We are going to be in for a much Back worse yep. problem than his body just healing." And we ran into all three types of doctors during that time. Um, at the trauma center, they were great. I mean, they saved his life. They had him, uh, obviously, on high uh, amounts. He had a high tolerance to begin with. That probably right. was a genetic link from his, his right. father. Um, but they let him out with uh, a greater reduced amount of painkillers just to help him. I didn't have a clue. He didn't. Um, and they told us, and we were out of state, mind you, so they told us that we had to find a pain management doctor. Well, I got turned down. Um, I went through a list of 20. Nobody wanted to pick him up. This was 2010. So this is when things were starting you know, to uh, mm -hmm. change over for me. Here it is to, oh, no, we're, we're not going to give you any. So we had a lot of those. Um, I did find one that treated the pain. So they kept escalating the dose, escalating. They had him up to 800 milligrams of oxycodone a day. Holy Moses. That, that is end-stage cancer treatment. Yeah, it is. And then, yeah, is. yeah. And then finally, they didn't know what to do. And then we found the... A uh, third type who would like the uh, pill mill doctors. Mm -hmm. So I we learned a lot about what addiction was the hard way, mm -hmm. and um, I did send him to treatment um, the first time. And in my ignorance and denial, I thought thirty, sixty, ninety would be fine. Oh, good, he's in thirty days. He'll get it. He'll be okay all will be well. The treatment center said he needs to stay more. I, I blame that on me because um, I said, no, come home. I want you back in college. Mm -hmm. And four months, I, but then of course, everything escalated. And I had one of those moments of epiphany or grace or whatever you call it, where my denial snapped and I knew I was going to find him dead. Yeah. And it just wasn't, I just was not about to walk in there. And I walked in his room one morning, I found a needle. Um, and I just told him, honey, I love you, but you've got two choices. I know what you're up to. You're. I'm going to give you 24 hours to get out of the house. No car phone, no, no keys, no money, no anything. You are totally out on your own or you go into a full year treatment center as far away from North Carolina as I can find. I left, I went in my office uh, 10 minutes later. I thoroughly expected him to come in and have another one of the grand rows, you know? And right. he just sat down with tears in his eyes. He said, mom, I've tried to stop. I've tried to stop so many times. Right. I have tried everything I know. 
I can't, I don't know, help me. And within 48 hours, we had him on an airplane from North Carolina out to Los Angeles, and he was in a detox state at the treatment center for 60 days, and then went into a um, sobriety house there, and uh, who walked out was my son, was a man. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I was very, very grateful. Unfortunately, in my story, um, because of Luke's internal injuries, he had to go back and have mm-hmm. more surgeries. And he had blockages. And every time that happened, um, they had to put him on the drugs all over again. It was then that I found out at the hospitals about what doctors don't know. Doctors don't know about addiction. They don't know how to treat it. Um, Even the um, anesthesiology that is used putting a patient in others. Some will trigger, others will not. Um, I was very fortunate to have a friend, a very close friend who is an anesthesiologist, and she's one of the few people who took a rotation in addiction medicine years ago uh, because she had a family member. So she helped to guide the doctors at hospitals, use this, don't use this. Um, But still, going from one uh, clinic or one part of, of the hospital, the nurses, they did not know really what substance use disorder meant. Still don't. Um yeah. I, I mean it was uh it it was um scary and, and um I I really had to take a strong advocacy and just insist that they look into this and uh, still so many were just meh. You know. Yeah, you know, you know, Susan. First of all, look, I, I, I'm I'm going to say this. Um, you were you were probably fighting a losing battle right there, a- I know. and and yeah. and it's not your fault. Okay, I it know. is. It it simply isn't. As a mother, you did everything under the sun. There's a couple of things I want to say on this. One, there's a, a a wonderful lady. Her family. Her name is Beth. I won't mention her last name. They were my very first client. And their son has now passed. Um, but when he was in high school, he got started on OxyContin by a doctor here in Fresno. And this this person, I, I won't even call him a doctor, was prescribing so much Oxy. He, he, you could walk into his office today and he is still going to prescribe each patient 240, t- this is per month, 240 10 milligram Norco. 30, 30 milligram Percocet, um, 20, uh, 10 milligram Valium. He's going to call you in twice a month for uh, uh, shots of Dilaudid for breakthrough pain. And he does that with every single client. And the point of this is she walked in there and and confronted him on it. And he just called her a crazy mother that didn't know what, what the hell she was talking about. Okay. So okay. You're, 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 you're not alone in this. And the other piece to this is what folks don't understand. Doctors have their own prescribing practices. And what mm. I mean by that is this. There are doctors, no matter, I, I mean, I have to see several doctors, all right? But they all know I'm in recovery. But for example, one doctor may prescribe for whatever procedure you have, 40, 10 milligram Norco. Another mm-hmm. doctor for the same procedure may prescribe 20. Another may prescribe 30. Another may prescribe 80. They're not going to break that pattern of what they do, of what they prescribe. It is simply stuck in their head that this is this is what it is. And they will prescribe those amounts because they don't want the patients calling back asking for more. Right. They're, they're, they're tired of the phone calls. Hey, can you refill my prescription? Can you refill my prescription? So a lot of these doctors are going to start, they've always over-prescribed, okay, for that, maybe just not that reason alone, but that reason has a lot to do with it right there. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, please call Pain Parents and Addicts in Need at 559-579-1551 or visit us online at painnonprofit.org. Follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram, and TikTok at Pain Nonprofit. And please subscribe to the Don't Hide the Scars podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. And if you would like to donate to Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need, please click the link in the description to make your tax deductible donation today and help us save more lives gripped by addiction. When you take a look that there are about 180 uh, medical uh, teaching institutions, only 11 of them have an addiction medicine program. They only teach how to prescribe and or not to prescribe narcotics. I mean, even when 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 my son uh, passed, I had an appointment with with my doctor um, just like three three weeks later. And I told her and she, of course, was very sorry. And then she turns to me and she said, but we're learning so much on how not to make that happen anymore. And I looked at her and I said, yeah, but what are you doing for the people that already are in that situation? The look on her face, I mean, it was it was blank. It they don't realize, in my opinion, at all what is really going on. And yet, how can they when the very institutions don't teach it? I mean, right. you get one hour on narcotics. Yes. That is just not going to cut it for a chronic disease. Right. It right. just it won't. I yeah. didn't know that. Oh, yeah. That's unreal. So it's unbelievable. I spoke That's... at a medical thing. I don't know. This was about three months ago uh, here in town. And um, I, I, again, you think I wouldn't be shocked by now, you know, but when mm-hmm. I spoke at this thing, I was on a panel um, and it was all physicians from around the, the Fresno, San Joaquin Valley area. I would venture to say that seriously, 95, 96% of them hadn't a clue on what on what we were talking about the questions that they asked exactly. back were something that should have come from a high school student you know exactly. they had no idea the 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 the, the fact that a couple of them at, at least admitted it was mm. fine you know because it's like okay i i am you know the doctor would say oh, i'm going to look into this and i'm yeah you need to you know, you need to you need to get off your asses here, guys, and and, right. and you need to find right. out exactly what's going on because you know again, a doctor to do no harm. That's that's your first goal is is to do no harm, and to take that one step further. That means for all patients, not all patients except the addicts. <laughs> there are two or three studies out now about the bias of how doctors treat patients, not just in the ED, but all over. The um, gentleman who wrote the afterword in uh, my book, he is an addiction specialist. His his, uh, name is uh, Dr. Aaron Gupta. And he wrote a book on uh, the preventable um, opioid crisis. The statistics that he has in there about the medical uh, profession and and I grabbed one here. Um, he said the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which is ASAM, indicates that 41 million people in America are at risk of dying from substance use disorder. Only 2.4 are in treatment. The remaining 39 million have no access to care. Correct. And he said of the 331 million people in the U.S., approximately 900. Uh, 950,000, which is 29.29 uh, are uh, physicians. The total number of addiction practitioners with necessary credentials to treat SUD is 138,000. And yet today there are less than 7,000 who provide care to the 2.4 million. Yeah. Look at those statistics. Right. Yeah. It's How do we get people to care? Unfortunately, and I think this is one of the things we're stuck in and stigma is at the court. You get people to care when they lose someone. And when we take a look that we've got, what, 300 people a day going down mm-hmm. be, because of yeah. this. So there are these people out, out there. What keeps them from stepping forward is 
that stigma that they think it was a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I, I, I also believe that when it comes when it comes to, to, to stigma, that we, wow, this is this is always difficult for me. Because again, I think we've done a fairly good job on the awareness piece. I, I, I do believe that it's, it is getting better as far as, as far as our message to understand that, that addicts are people like me and Jason. And, you know, we're not just, we, we came from somewhere. We're just not homeless bums peeing on the side of the street. Okay. But when we talk about the stigma and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'll be the first guy to admit when I'm wrong. All right. But the ones that we have to get to is, is, is as it relates to stigma is the physicians is the oh, lawmakers yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'm oh, sorry. It's it's yes. not mom and pop over here. I mean, they need to be a part of it. Yes. Okay. But it's getting the right asses in the right seats in order for this thing to change. We right. I can go, I can go and speak to parents all day long. Tens of thousands of parents, I can go speak to them. And if we but, and if we Right. If we call for everybody to move their butts up to Sacramento because we got an important initiative going on, two may show up. Parents aren't going to take that time to do that. And why? Mm. Because it's why? because, uh, again, there's stigma there attached. OK, there, 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 there is stigma. But the parents aren't the ones that are going to ultimately make the decision on how no, we but the change parents vote. it. The but parents the parent, vote to get yes, the they, right people in. And yes, they do. It is. I'm one person. And yet um, the only thing I'm living for is to try to create a movement. Of course. It starts yeah. with one person. Mothers Against Drunk Driving started with one. Yep. Okay. And it. um I'm just trying to put it out there as much I can and to educate nonstop and try to influence and to get that influence going. Because if enough people get mad and organize in these kind of groups, then we can vote for the right people who put this on their agenda. And as you and I both know, the fentanyl crisis is a lot more than it just coming across the border. Mm -hmm. And yet that's all the news carries. So mm -hmm. um, I just, I'm just trying to keep that ball moving forward and to encourage Hollywood. Now I've seen a little bit of a change there and mm -hmm. yes, uh, uh -huh. because always the, you know, addict was the uh, bad person. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm not crazy about that word. Um, because either, we don't way. call people with uh, who have mental d uh, disabilities retards, you right. know, um, and it's the disease is terrible, but the person is not correct, you know, and correct. just even seeing online. I mean, J uh, Johns Hopkins has got a wonderful vocabulary list about how we just need to change how we talk about things instead of I'm clean. Well, that means you were dirty. No, I'm in recovery is to match the language with mm -hmm. the disease and take the, that stigma side out of it. It's a slow change. Look what happened with AIDS. What is one of the biggest things that changed the AIDS is uh, the the um, the movie the the uh, uh, what was with it? Denzel uh, Philadelphia Philadelphia story no the uh, Dallas with, uh, Buyers Club oh Dallas. no Dallas Buyers Club yeah 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 because it it brought it brought it out there and movies and books have a tendency uh going back uh Ch chicago blue 
the blacklist, they started to have yep. some characters they who did. were suffering and how they treated it was so much different. So I, I think it is starting to creep in. Uh, you know, peer pressure goes two ways. Um, we all in our own way have to do our part. I don't like being on some of these uh, fentanyl uh, Facebook sites because it's grief, heartache, grief, heartache. Right. And right. yet I know that if I'm not, and I don't just gently, lovingly inform people and then help to uh, have them take action, get it out there. Um, one of the most painful things that happened to me was right after Luke uh, passed away. Um, everybody assumed he went out to get high. Um, he was not on narcotics at all. He had he had a, a, a general anxiety disorder, and uh, he had he just had a panic attack. It started sure. from airplane ear, uh, where his um, eustachian tubes block when he landed at home. He went into a full pan panic. He went to the clinic, okay. and the hour uh, he he said there was a three hour wait. He asked a friend for a clonopin. Mm -hmm. oh. I know it was not that, but everybody assumed. I wrote in Luke's obituary, along with the fact that he was in an Ivy League school, he was Hollywood handsome. He had an IQ of 140. He started his own company. I mean, you would never look at him and think he had this uh, disorder. Um, and uh, But I wrote about the good things he did, but then I, I put that he, he died of an unsuccessful attempt at self-medication. Mm. So many people, why did you put that in there? I said, because it's true. Right. And right. But the people, when they came to greet me, they wouldn't look at me. I I'm, you know, and I was like, why are you ashamed? I was not ashamed of my son. Right. My son had a disease. He fought for, I mean, I had 11 and a half extra years with him because technically he should have been gone. And I've never seen somebody fight. He'd always say, fall down six, get up seven. Right. Um, and for other people to be embarrassed for me, I won't stand for it. I have Good nothing more to lose, gentlemen. I have right. nothing more to lose so right. getting out there with my shotguns with it, it it's not about buying a book it's about learning what is in there to pass it on to to create a movement to save lives i never right. want another parent or mother to get that phone call that i did right. it took me right. to my knees I'm I'm hoping in North Carolina you have better luck than we do in California because it is um out out here and and by the way you are you are right it's it's about who is in office but you know Susan I've been doing this a long time okay a long time we've been before Sacramento we've been before the the state public health and safety committee we have we have talked to them constantly over and over and over again and and at the very best what they do is will say something to appease us for a very right. short time that's 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 what it what it comes down to and we do here in california i, I again i'm not i'm not look I, I deal with more folks that have lost kids and the groups and the organizations and the moms that are starting grief groups and doing these things. And it is, it's, it's wonderful. And, 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 and I want you to keep going. I want you to just light it on fire because that's what we need out there. Okay. That's, that's what we need. I'm still trying to figure out a way that we can get somebody in office that is actually going to do something about this because nobody, at least in this election in California, is running on the platform of 
fentanyl at all. Well, I, we, no. I, I don't know if you saw, we had a, we, our, our wonderful governor literally on TV. Hey, I self-medicate yeah. uh, every now and then. I totally understand. Like, are you? Oh, oh, are we you came on TikTok and did it. We we can show we can show you <laughs> clips of Newsom, okay, saying, "Hey, there's nothing wrong with self medicating. I I I do it a few times a week." Blah blah blah. Do you also know what he said? He says the biggest mistake the United States ever did was pretending we could get people clean and sober. Mm. That was that 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 was his line. So when that's our leadership, when that's our leadership. I mean, oh, you know, uh, in in the state. Um, I know who gave my son the pill. Mm -hmm. In the state of North Carolina, they could be charged with first degree murder. In Los Angeles County, the police wouldn't even talk to me. Wouldn't it? Right. Said there's no crime here. And I said, well, kind of, yeah, there is. Yeah. Right. Um, Well, I hear you. I don't see any options except to keep fighting because if we stop, nothing's going to happen and you look at civil rights how many years did that take long time we had a breakthrough you look through women's rights you look through what happened with aids with lgbtq Mm -hmm. it's a fight and i'm not saying it is not a fight but um that's our only option it is our only option it is our only only option and to keep pushing and you never know you truly you never know who that one person is that one impact whether it's you know my if they come up with another movie that would auto you know go bam and hit home i think hollywood has a lot of influence and i don't know why they're hiding this well well susan let me just let me just tell you this okay keep your ears open because because we're working with some people down there right now. Uh, good. Yay. Yeah, we're working Yay. with some people down there right now. There there is there is a movement down there. Um we <laughs> yeah, literally one of one of my friends that's getting yeah, that we're getting involved with in LA, literally on the set of a movie, uh did the fake blow and then did the real stuff with the fellow stars now long term recovery. So these are people that have been, been there to see it understand it and and i agree with you because i don't i think and it's been something we've been trying very hard and are making the headway is is getting that that individual that people know that's a household name that they're gonna listen yes exactly because hollywood has changed they are great influencers i hate to say but a lot of people need to be told what to do and how to feel yeah Hmm. and they see a movie we can give as much and i'm i'm going back to aristotle here ethos pathos and logos okay (laughs) we can have all the ethics and we can have all of the words all of the stats we need the pathos and of ethos pathos and logos the gut the feeling even aristotle had to concede you're not going to get anywhere unless the pathos leads. And that is why Hollywood is the important thing because they can bring the story, whose ever story, whatever that message is, they have the medium and you get the right influential people in there, people will see it and have that aha moment because they'll be touched by the pathos of it. Mm -hmm. Just like in in the Dallas Buyers Club. Right, yeah. right. And some yeah, of so these it's... other movies with civil rights, with LGBTQ. Right. You hit yeah. him. Hit him there. Got, you got, yeah, you, yeah, we got, got it. So stay tuned for that one, you know, because we're going <laughs> to, you know, we'll, we'll, I will, be, we'll, I will. We'll, we'll be calling you to see if you want to join on the bandwagon on this one. Oh, I'll be um, there. I'll be, a, right. and, a, and, you know, um, uh, one of the writers, um, of the screenplay is Tom Ferran, who writes for Yellowstone. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. You know, one of the things I do, one of the things I do want to bring up because I'd like, I'd like to get your opinion on this real quick is. Okay. One of the hurdles that I see Hmm. 
um, in this are or and we 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 had a great podcast the other day with uh, with a guy named Steve Adami, who um, is executive director of one of the programs for Salvation Army in San Francisco. And uh, this guy, I just love this man. All right, and even the mayor of San Francisco came out and said, you know, the the long-term harm reduction is ruining our city. And, and he's, and he's absolutely right because we're not offering solutions to, to anybody here. Um, we're just keeping them medicated. We're giving them housing, but you know, for, for all the housing, housing doesn't solve the addiction problem. In fact, 71% of their overdoses of the overdose fatalities came under the roofs of how, of houses that were given to, to addicts yeah, and street people at a fixed address, at a fixed address, you know, so, so, so then handed them the drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. In essence, that's that's what they're doing. Nice. Then you then you have organizations like, and I'm going to keep mentioning these guys on the air. Okay, is dancesafe.org. You might want to write that one down. I'm going to. And dancesafe.org. Um, these people I now consider the enemy okay. because they are all about uh, safe supply. Um, I hate that word. I do because there's nothing safe about a, about a drug supply at all. Um, no. they're, they're, they promote, um, for the lack of a better term, sh shooting galleries for people to go into so they can safely inject their drugs. Uh, they want to keep everybody on long-term methadone, long-term suboxone, uh, their events, they distribute fentanyl test strips. Cause of course they don't want anyone they want to play their part of, we did everything we could to prevent an overdose at our event and we distributed test strips. And I think even some we'd seen they have Narcan no, yep. and, and, and by the way, we're big promoters of Narcan. We, we distribute out of this office more Narcan than probably anybody in the San Joaquin Valley because we are huge proponents of it. All right. But well, Narcan, it's needed. It, it's needed it is, the it is. There. The problems, sure, but, it's, but but it's a life saving tool. It's not a treatment right. tool. Exactly. Okay? It's not exactly. a treatment tool, because so so. But fentanyl test strips. I mean, how th this is this is the the madness that that I'm dealing with, and I want you to understand this. As mm -hmm. an opioid addict, and in particular a fentanyl addict, I'm sitting right here. Do you honestly think if I'm jonesing, if I'm kicking, if I'm going through withdrawal symptoms, that I'm going to go through a four-step process and 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 test to see if there's fentanyl in the drug that I'm buying? I'm not going to waste my time. Of course, I want the fentanyl that's in there. Or any You're of your drugs. You're not going to have any... a mindset to even think about it. Ex yeah. Exactly. Right. E exactly. Right. So, so we're right. spending millions of dollars on fentanyl test strips. Now, I will say this because I still have a heart, right? If, if, and I don't, I'm not promoting this, obviously. But if there is a casual cocaine user on a Saturday night, all right, that that does cocaine, I don't know, once a month, once every six months, whatever it is. Damn it! You better have a fentanyl test strip to test that cocaine because you could wind yeah. up dead. Absolutely. Right. But Absolutely. but but to, but to say that that is a treatment tool for for a drug addict is is like well, are you kidding me? No, and you 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 bring up a really good point too. Um, uh, Luke used to call uh, methadone a dirty drug. He just said it just oh, yeah. makes me feel just oh. terrible. And we had Filthy. to put him in treatment after his second huge surgery. They had to walk him down with methadone but he he voluntarily went in for 30 days just to get off of that that's a pain um, in the ass yeah but um the the drug uh, um suboxone it's a wonderful tool if it's used right anything can be abused you go out and get too much sunshine you are going to get burned yeah. um uh dr gupta who's who's in my book he claims that about 80 to 85 percent of his patients who are on it go on to live wonderful successful lives they go they have to go in and see him sometimes he prescribes it sometimes he doesn't he keeps track of how they're doing if they're going through uh high stress points which would mean triggers that it might overwhelm them then he'll up it if everything's going good cuts back cuts back cuts back but they've got a safe place to go that 
if they do. And then he gets a lot of people off because it's not, it, no cancer is the same. No disease is exactly the same. No brain is the same. And I think we have to get off this mindset that one addiction is identical to the other. Um, uh, they've identified um, that there are different brain chemistries that will attract uh, narcotic addiction or alcoholic or uh, benzos that, you know, it, it's not just one across, but right. it's complex. It's very complex. If you don't have people there to help guide, but, you know, you would never take people with cancer, put them in a room and say, go uh, shoot, shoot yourself up with the chemo. You know? Right. You know, I own a treatment facility as well. And now that we're dealing with not only fentanyl, but we're dealing with fentanyl that's laced with benzos, um, that changes our detox protocol. Mm. I'm Think sure about it does. It. Be because I'm benzos sure and does. opioids are two different, two different animals. So, Absolutely. so, it, cha it, so it changes our detox protocols. But, you know, here's yeah. the question I'd like to ask Dr. Gupta, to be honest with mm. you, okay? is um but first of all let me say this the goal which i believe and i still believe it and i'll go to my my grave saying this the goal should be abstinence so so it it it, it should be not saying it's always going to get there okay but we need to be able to tell these people it is possible for you it Absolutely. is possible right. because why are we going to strap i'm sorry i was on methadone that's the devil's drug Okay, it took me two years to get off of it by myself because there was not a methadone clinic that wanted to That's take me off too. of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's horrible. But but this is my biggest complaint with with Zaboxone doctors and and methadone is Dr. Gupta and every other doctor out there doing this. Are they explaining the potential long term health risks that go along with this? Because I've had them. I've had the constipation to the point where they had to repair my insides. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've had the heart, I've had two open heart surgeries. Okay. I've had damn near everything that is associated with methadone use and opioid use in general. And mm -hmm. so when, when you're talking to a 25 year old or a 30 year old, even a 40 or 50 year old, and you're going to leave somebody on that stuff for, for the rest of their life, you better damn well tell them what they're in for. And you better damn well tell them that, by the way, if you're if you take your family to Hawaii and you forget your methadone, you can't walk into another clinic in Hawaii and get it. He and I have had that talk. Good. Mm. OK, because um, Luke needed it to walk off of the surgeries. He needed it. I get it. He had a screw in his neck because he had rods and bolts mm. in his back, um, but he didn't like being on it, he had that constipation. The best years we had together were the three and a half years he was off of everything. Now, he had a different addiction, golf. He had to go out and golf every single day, whether it, I mean, rain, hail, it didn't matter. It gave his brain the dopamine yep. fix that it needed. And when you take a look at diet, nutrition, and exercise on how it can change the receptors, the data is amazing. I know. So and and <clears throat> I am I am for Suboxone as a tool because right. it would have helped us so much if somebody in the hospital could have said, you bought been on X amount, you've still got some pain. Let's monitor walk yeah. you off but yes again the goal is to get off of it it would have been helpful too if the people in luke's sobriety community would have said bud you're working it and you're, you're still one of us instead oh you're on that you're not a part of us anymore yeah. that yeah, broke right. his heart yeah I I can only because imagine. that was I the only imagine. support group that he had right. right and they cut him off right and he he had had two years. He was just shy of his third, you know, because we had to do this in chunks. Sure. And he had another uh, uh, blockage. 
and they almost had had to uh, give him a uh, a a, a colostomy at, at the last minute they went in and fixed it from from the inside i mean he was so close and when he got out he used kratom tea Oof. to help walk himself off of it because he was on uh he was in there for 10 days on uh morphine right and they they said instantly all your time is gone because he couldn't get suboxone, just something to help walk off. And of course, insurance. Oh, heaven forbid. A, oh, I was going to uh, ask you about other that. Podcast. What, was oh, the, uh, no. what was the fun this go is, with the insurance at this time? This is a good one. He had insurance pay for, for the surgery. I mean, they had to open him all the way up, go all the way through him and pick out things. And so he was on a lot. We walked him down. He went into the treatment center. Three weeks later, after he got out, he had the first blockage. Well, they had to put the NGT, NG tube in, shoot him up with morphine for a week. I called the insu uh, in insurance com company and said, listen, he needs to go back in for a detox and just help him. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Only once a, a year. And I said, he didn't go out to get high, okay? He had a blockage. He was put back on. I've got the charts. I mean, they were like this stacked this tall at this time. You know, it didn't matter. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. No. I mean, if you were to walk in to the ED and have a heart attack and have them say, oh, I'm sorry, you already had one this year. We can't help you. Yeah. Susan, when, 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 when yeah. we're, when we're, yes, no, I, I get it because again, I, I own a treatment center and, and treatment centers at this point, we, we are seeing a reduction in the time that we're given with people. Um, I mean, some, I mean, look, there are policies out there that will allow 28 days, 30 days, uh, of, of detox and residential. They'll allow right. several months of outpatient, but, but we all know that the residential piece to that is key. All right. Yes. You just don't get some, you just don't get somebody off of the drug and then send them out to a sober living and expect everything to be wonderful again. But we're seeing a reduction, sometimes 17 days. And we have to fight. And so every day we have to, it's called a utilization review. They they come back and say, we're going to give you two more days. We have to send back, no, we need three more days or we need four more days. They send it back. We're going to give you one more day. No, we now need five more days. That is a yeah, constant I, daily battle we have to do work with with the insurance companies. It's crap. I worked at a psych hospital way back in the 1980s, and I worked with kids. I, I'm teaching under a different one of my uh, degrees. I, I have got two uh, terminal degrees, and I worked at the psych hospital. It broke my heart. I had to leave it because I couldn't take the, these kids and have to give them back after 28 yeah. days and put them in the back in the exact same environment because their insurance Correct. ran out. And yeah. uh, statistics tell us it can take up to a year, if not more, for the receptors yep. to heal. Yep. Yep. Sobriety houses, they need to have, you know, I mean, I was fortunate. I had a mother who had means and she was not about to let her precious grandson sure. go. And every time I would take that check to, to the mailbox, it broke my heart because I knew there were other mothers out there who loved their sons just as much as I love mine, but who didn't have this check and yeah. therefore did not have nearly the same kind of a chance Correct. that I had. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It's sad. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and and again, look, we we we're not going to give up either, you know. Good. Um Good. never. Um like I said I've been doing this a long time and and the one the one thing I decided that I was going to do in the very beginning no matter what happened was tell the truth about this. And um because as God a recovering you. opiate addict, I I you know, I should be I should be dead. I mean, there's, there's no other, you know, 37 surgeries and 80 pills a day and, you know, all the, the, all the madness and the behavior and everything that went with it. I'm still married to the same woman, which is just a, an amazing <laughs> feat in itself, but it's all her. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's it, and so I get I get wound up. Jason knows that, and I'm and now I'm getting to the point where I'm getting him wound up because because it's going to take. Oh, us, I get wound. You know, I get wound, wound up. up. It's it's going to take it's going to take us. Sometimes you know, it's it's how we get mad at something. You know, it's it's but but we got to get mad at it. You know, we do. It, it, Right. And it's just like when I get mad at my addiction, I was telling him this the, the, the other day, I had to have um, uh, I'd have foot surgery back in October uh, to where they literally massacred my foot. I was in a boot. I got out of the boot January 18th. I'm still, you know, I mean, it's fine. The foot's fine and it's healing as it's supposed to be. But when you're dealing with the foot, you know, a lot of bones, a lot of nerves, a lot of all that stuff in there. And yeah. and I, I mean, I couldn't even swing a golf club for 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 four and a half months. Uh, I am back not playing my normal game, but I'm, but I'm back. Um, and 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 so my doctors know. Right. But my wife gets them. I got 20 pills. I didn't even use them all. She gets them because sometimes for those types of surgeries, the pain is that bad where you have to have something short term. But then again, of course, like I said, every everybody knows this. And then last Friday, <laughs> last Friday, I'm playing with my guys and it just happened to be my orthopedic doctor that was behind me in his golf cart. I came to a complete stop. He wasn't paying attention. He rams me going full bore in the golf cart. I'm at a dead stop. He pushes me oh. eight feet in front of my ball. He gets out. He's just beside himself because he knows what I've been through with this foot. He, we, he thinks he didn't see anything on the x-ray, uh, but now I got to go in and, and do an MRI. We, he may think it's a, it's a, what, what is it? Rotator. Rotator cuff. cuff, but, but he's not quite sure. I don't think it's all that bad because I can do some things, but here's my point. When, <laughs> when I got home and my wife was there and I'm not going to use all the language I use because she, she hates me when I say those words, but, but. I got so mad at at not only not not only because it happened, which is nobody's fault. I'm not blaming anybody. It was an accident. That's all it was. But I told her straight up, I go, I will not get an effing pill. I will not call him and get this. I will do this. And my point here is is that sometimes we in recovery, we have to get that mad at our disease in order to fight this. This isn't about rainbows and butterflies and unicorns and all that other horse shit that goes on out there. This is serious. But wouldn't it be nice to have an option if science, I mean, 1% of the money goes into research and development. Wouldn't yeah. it be nice to have science? I mean, Luke started a CBD oil company, no THC, just that yeah. to help others with anxiety. Yeah. You know, to have some kind of options. He he broke his hand and he too, I, you know, I said, honey, please, is there any way that you can not take anything? He said, I already told him. Mom. Right. He said, I'm hurting. Right. I've got right. ice. Right. Right. You know, and he said, it's, I can't use the word, you know, it's, it's terrible, but it's what I have to live with. Right. Because Exa exactly. this is my disease. E and exactly. He, and he was very brave. His his other friend, too, I mean, uh, cut his uh, uh, Achilles hand, uh, tendon. They put him out. But when he came out, you know, the nurse wanted to shoot him up. And, and he said, get away from me. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the, the, the people need to understand that, that, that I call it a healing pain. There's a difference. Uh, I'm not talking about major surgery like like Luke had, but but I'm talking about you know when you break a leg, when you break a thumb, you know, and it's one thing with that initial pain when it happens, and right. then once you once you get it repaired or fixed by the doctor, it's still going to hurt, but you know that that pain, if it's done right, is going to go away, you know, right. and so you have to kind of get it in your mindset that that's exactly what it is, and that by you know by a week it's going to be better, by ten days it's going to be even better, and yeah, and those know, are kind of the games that I got to play. Just yeah, turn on pill. TV. Got a pill for yeah. this, pill for this, pill for this, pill yeah. for this, and then they're making musicals out of it. Of course, <laughs> you know? I mean, there's a diabetic. <laughs> commercial where it's a full you know i'm just like oh, oh yeah oh yeah it's a full broadway show oh if i have it to is. hear another ozempic jingle i'm oh, gonna lose oh, my God. mind oh, i know it 
I know it. What's well, uh, yeah? Now there's data coming out about how people are addic- addicted to that. No, they, they are because they're losing weight on it. Oh, yeah. anyway. And what is the status? St- the statistic the United States uses what percentage Not, of all? We, we use ninety nine percent of the world's Vicodin supply, and we use something like ninety five percent of the world's opiate supply. But this is the commercial that got me, Susan. Just just because I know we got to end it down here, okay? But when they came when when they came out with the commercial, um, do you have opioid induced constipation? <laughs> and and I swear to God, and this was a, this is a commercial because we now have a pill. If you're taking opioids, we now have a pill that will relieve you of that. And I wanted to sit there and go, no shit, okay? You know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's of it, course you do. Of course you do. Ah, okay, we're gonna get you, you on the top end and the back. It, end. That's what I wrote in a piece. I said now they got you going in and they got you coming out. Okay, I I said yeah, take some Marilax and everything will be fine. My God, everything. Yeah, yeah. Oh. but gentlemen, thank you so much for having me. And and more importantly, thank you for what you're doing. Don't get discouraged. We have no options. Right. And I love what I hear with your Hollywood. Push it. I I honestly feel they're going to be one of the big keys with their influence. Yeah, They yeah, influence they so much else, you know, but however it comes, it, it needs, it, it needs to come. Yeah, so we're, 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 we're all it individual hard. drops going into a big pond to help others. And I believe that's what it's all about. So you bet. Absolutely. Uh, for anyone that would like to uh, check out the book, and Susan, I'll have your links in the podcast description, Slow Dance with the Devil. There's some beautiful pictures in there of Luke. He he truly was. That was a Hollywood smile. Oh, you know it. Man. He was Hollywood <laughs> handsome with the it factor and all. He's brilliant. Yeah, I miss him. Yeah, I miss I him bet. a lot. I bet. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being you. Thank you, Susan. We appreciate you you so so much. much. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, please call Pain Parents and Addicts in Need at 559-579-1551 or visit us online at painnonprofit.org. Follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Pain Nonprofit. And please subscribe to the Don't Hide the Scars podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. And if you would like to donate to Pain, Parents and Addicts in Need, please click the link in the description to make your tax-deductible donation today and help us save more lives gripped by addiction.